My name is Chris Van Tullican. I'm a broadcaster, I'm an academic, I'm a physician in London, and I'm also a UNICEF UK high profile supporter. I was conceived in the late 70s at about the same time as the code. The code had a slightly longer gestation, but we have grown up together. We're both entering early middle age, I hope with a long productive life ahead of us. To say that it's an honor to host uh, this meeting, this celebration doesn't begin to describe my feelings. The code is the most important document in my professional life. Uh, I believe that it is one of the most important documents in public health globally throughout history. Um, and it has a genius, which we are here to celebrate today. I want to be brief, but to make this work smoothly, I have just a few technical instructions for you all. Recordings will be available afterwards on the global breastfeeding website uh, in different languages. We've disabled the chat function, uh, so it's for announcements only. You can't chat there because there are so many wonderful delegates at the meeting. Um, if you have questions, please share them for the speakers in the Q&A box. If you look at the bottom of your Zoom uh, down, uh, down at the bottom, you'll see a Q&A box. And speakers will try and address any questions as the webinar goes on. And uh, uh, an organizing committee member may post you a web link if it can be, uh, if your question can be answered with a link online. Support, if you need technical support, please begin your message with capital letters, support, um, and a, a member of the, the technical uh, guidance team will get to you. If you need emotional support, I just wanna say we are uh, one big team. This is a very difficult time for many, many people around the world. And I'm sure I'm not alone in wanting to send a lot of digital love to everyone who is in this webinar. Um, Social uh, media, we would encourage you to post social media channels during the webinar. Uh, there are hashtags BMS code 40 and babies before profit. Um, we also have an interactive poll device. Can we put up the Mentimeter slide? Um, if we put that up now, uh, if you go to uh, there's, there's a there's a link in the chat or you can go to Mentimeter.com or Mentimeter.com. Sorry, it's Menti.com and use the code 82916853. And it's an interactive poll. We really want you all to engage with that. Um, so if you head over there now, um, you'll see the first question. We've got over a thousand delegates registered for this webinar. And my first question to you all is, where are you? So on this link, I'm gonna do it with you now. Um, if I can get on my browser, uh, go, go to the question and just click on wherever you are in the world here we go i'm going to click on where i am and then hit submit and i will um come back to that after the first talk i'm extremely delighted to welcome uh, the unicef executive director henrietta four known to many of us simply as ed4 um, and she is going to begin with opening remarks thank you very much Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, we are certainly delighted that you have been conceived and that you are hosting us today. So um, may I join all of the distinguished partners and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, Tedros, to welcome you all to this session. On behalf of UNICEF and our partners in the Global Breastfeeding Collective, Welcome to everyone to mark this event, the 40th anniversary of the International Code of Marketing and Breast Milk Substitutes. Today is a reason to celebrate, as Chris has said, to celebrate the genius of this International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes. In the past four decades, we have seen a 50% increase in the prevalence of exclusive breastfeeding. And this success is due in large part to the efforts that you have made to protect, to promote, and to support breastfeeding and to uphold the commitments of the code. The code was adopted 40 years ago in response to widespread unethical marketing practices that were encouraging mothers to purchase unnecessary, inferior, and expensive breast milk substitutes. These practices led to a drastic decline in breast milk and breast feeding. 
with catastrophic consequences to the survival, growth and development of millions of children. The evidence is clear. Wherever they are born in the world, breastfeeding gives children the best start in life. It protects babies from common infectious diseases, which can make the difference between life and death. It boosts children's immune systems and ensures that they have key nutrients that they need to grow and to develop to their full potential. And it reduces the risk of obesity and diabetes later in life. Since the adoption of the code four decades ago, a majority of countries have enacted legislation to implement at least some provisions of the code. And an estimated 900 million infants globally have enjoyed the survival, growth and development benefits of exclusive breastfeeding. This demonstrates that positive change for nutrition is possible and is happening at scale. However, there is still work to be done. Half of the world's children are not exclusively breastfed and ever more sophisticated marketing practices continue to undermine mothers and families' confidence in breastfeeding. And this includes the misguided fear that COVID-19 can be passed through breastfeeding. Despite clear evidence and guidance from WHO and UNICEF, that mothers suspected or known to have COVID-19 should continue to breastfeed. So there is still work to do. As we mark 40 years since the adoption of the code, the World Health Organization and UNICEF are urging all partners to work together to continue bringing it to life. We urge all governments to adopt legal measures that will enforce the code fully. For example, taking a lead from India where the law explicitly forbids breast milk substitutes being promoted to mothers and pregnant women. We urge all baby formula companies to fully adhere to the standards in the code as mandated by the World Health Assembly and its member states. We urge all governments and employers to support mothers and families. So breastfeeding is a feasible choice for them this should include family-friendly policies that support exclusive breastfeeding. Young mothers need our help. And we urge health workers to continue standing with us in the forefront of the breastfeeding protection, promotion, and support in line with the code and the global guidance on infant and young child feeding by WHO and UNICEF. So in closing to all of our partners here today, UNICEF stands ready to work with all of you to give millions more children the best start in life. Let us work together to make this a reality. So back to you, Chris. Edie Paul, thank you for such inspiring, encompassing words. Next, we are delighted to have a video from WHO uh, Director General, uh, Tedros uh, Adhanom Ghebreyesus, uh, underlining the importance of this meeting. Excellencies, esteemed guests, dear colleagues and friends. 40 years ago today, the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes was adapted to safeguard the health of our most vulnerable citizens. It remains as important now as it was in 1981. Globally, inadequate breastfeeding is responsible for 11% of mortality in children under 5. The baby food industry continues to use many of the same promotional tactics they did in the 1970s. In addition, breast milk substitutes are now promoted online through social clubs, digital ads targeting pregnant women, photo competitions, and the use of influencers to endorse products. 
These marketing strategies undermine confidence and discourage mothers from breastfeeding, putting the health of both mothers and children at risk. That's why the code is so essential. Yet to date, only 25 countries have enacted legislation that substantially aligned with the code, while 58 countries have no legal measures in place. Our task going forward must be to step up efforts to convince every country to enact and enforce legislation to end the promotion of breast milk substitutes. Working together, we will help ensure that no matter where they are born, all children have the healthiest possible start in life. I thank you. Thank you very much to the Director General of the World Health Organization for that message. Um, next, we have, uh, unless there is a Mentimeter slide coming up, I'm not sure if we have the results from that first Mentimeter uh, question. I'd love to know where we all are in the world. So Jeanette may post up a slide. Here we are. So we've got, predictably, because it's the middle of the day in Europe, we have a lot of people near me, 132 of us, and then a massive spread across all the world's time zones, all the longitudes and all the latitudes. So um, that's hugely heartening for me to see and for I'm sure for all of you to see. Um, next, we have uh, a moderated conversation with national representatives from the Philippines, Turkmenistan, Kenya, Mexico and the United Kingdom. Uh, the moderator is David Clark, who is a human rights and public health lawyer and a formal league, former legal and formal legal, legal advisor to UNICEF. Um, good morning, everybody. Good morning from New York. I know it's a different time of day for some of you and um, distinguished delegates. Um, it is an absolute pleasure uh, to have been asked to moderate this uh, panel. Um, what we had in mind was actually um, getting in touch with representatives from countries that have been working hard to implement the, the code. That is to take this document and make it work in practice. So we have a, a pretty wonderful uh, panel here, I have to say. I'm very excited about speaking to these um, four country representatives that have been doing their very best to make sure that babies are put before business. And I'm going to start um, with um, Alison Hewless, who's the UK Member of Parliament, um, and is actually speaking from my hometown, Glasgow, Scotland, um, which is nice. Um, but in 2016, Alison, um, Alison put forward a bill calling for more information on the ingredients in baby milk formula and for more scientific testing. And she currently chairs an all party parliamentary group on infant feeding, infant feeding and inequalities, which I think is a great um, uh, group because we know that breastfeeding is actually one of the things that uh, it deals with inequalities because every baby that is breastfed is getting the best start to life. So Alison, it's a pleasure um, to, to, to speak to you and I'm, I'm going to go through different stages that, that you uh, as policymakers have to try and get through to get the code working and um, with um, I wanted to start with how you go about getting the uh, getting your colleagues to understand the importance of breastfeeding and the importance of the code. So why do you think the, that code implementation receives relatively low priority among policymakers? And what are some of the arguments that you have found to be compelling in bringing others on board? Thank you very much and first of all I want to say how honoured I am to be part of the conversation here today and I suppose I approached this issue um, 
of looking at where the code can fit and where um, policies could be improved through the work and the evidence that we got through the infant feeding all party group. We were hearing stories of um, parents who couldn't afford formula, stories of um, marketing um, being uh, pushed towards people through baby clubs, as um, uh, Dr. Tedros said, uh, being pushed through online um, influencers, and also issues of people not getting proper information. So information that they were getting was really marketing information being given uh, by formula companies rather than independent advice that they could trust. Um, and that seemed to me um, and to the other members of the all-party group to be a significant gap. So we brought forward this, this very small, this very modest uh, bill to get the conversation started in the UK to talk about the things that were influencing parents, to talk about the issues that were ongoing where people uh, felt as though they couldn't get that trusted information. And while the bill was not accepted as legislation, unfortunately, because I am a, an opposition uh, MP and, uh, as I say, it was a relatively small bit of legislation, it was important in getting that conversation going um, and having people think about, well, why is this important? Why is it um, something that people should pay attention to? And I'm using the experience from that bill and the information that we have continued to gather through the all-party group uh, to look at opportunities. So at the moment, for example, uh, there's a, a digital har uh, online harms bill that the UK government's looking to bring forward. And that would fit very well, I think, with issues around marketing uh, and the influencers and the way in which people are being uh, pushed marketing information. And I think perhaps these things haven't been on the agenda quite so much in the UK because you know the UK has been consumed with many other political issues at the moment, uh, Brexit being of course one of them. But this also gives the UK an opportunity to look at the legislation again to say, well, because it was always used as an excuse before that they couldn't fully implement the code because uh, of EU legislation. Well, now, if they were not in the EU, that gives us a fresh opportunity to look at this. And I'll certainly be doing all I can at the opportunity that I can to see, well, actually, this is now something the UK should be looking at as a priority. I, I, I think that's terrific, Alison. You've hit on, on a couple of things. I think the first thing is you said that your first attempt wasn't successful. And that's, that is something I've noticed over the years don't give up um, because yeah. you will get there in the end. Um, and, I, and I also, I like this idea of looking at some of the other opportunities that they are to bring in some of the elements um, um, of the code. Although, I mean, we do like it when a country adopts uh, a, a legislation that incorporates all of the code and the resolutions. There are sometimes opportunities, as, as you spoke here about the um, online harms bill that um, provide an opportunity um, to, to, to capture uh, or to close the the some of those uh, loopholes that are enabling the companies to continue to get to uh, mothers and um, so thanks very much for sharing that and um, Sharikat and Tamsudumin uh, as I mentioned um, um, th th this is the we're, we're talking here about the first um, the, about the first stage uh, in this process um, and I want to move from uh, from Scotland uh, to, to uh, Kenya now um, and speak uh, with Veronica Kirogo, who's the head of the Division I'm sorry, I'm actually hearing translation at the moment. Uh, oh, thanks. So, sorry about that. Um, Veronica Kirogo, who's the head uh, of the Division of Nutrition and Dietetics at the Ministry of Health in Kenya. And um, Veronica is a uh, nutritionist by profession, also has some background in agriculture, um, but she certainly understands the absolute importance of breastfeeding to infant and young child survival, growth and development, and how we must have the policy and regulatory framework in place in order to protect it. Um, so, um, Veronica, we know that Kenya was in, had, had managed to overcome this um, lack of interest in moving forward with the code in the early 2000s um, and moved ahead with the drafting and adopting of uh, regulations. Uh, but it took many years um, it, before you actually managed to get the legislation through in 2012. Um, but I do have to point out that as a result of the work that you've been doing, you were able in, in Kenya to increase exclusive breastfeeding rates from 32% in 2008 to 61% in 2014. So that certainly seems worth, um, worth celebrating. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you about some of the challenges or the hiccups 
a government might expect to come up against uh, in getting the national regulations drafted and then adopted into legislation. Are you Thank there? You, uh, oh, great. Thank you, David. Good to, see you. Good to see you, Veronica. Yes, confirm you can hear me. I can hear you very well. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, David. Yes, indeed, uh, Kenya made the straight uh, in terms of uh, improving the exclusive breastfeeding uh, uh, rates. And mainly, of course, we attribute this to the, uh, the act we have in place. If you recall, in 1881, Kenya was actually the first government to vote in favor of the code, and that showed the commitment of the country. But it, it was not a uh, walk in the park because it took over 30 years to actually have a national legislation in place. And why this 30 years? Yes, you find that there are many stakeholders. We are looking at the uh, infant formula industry. We are looking at the marketers. We are looking at the academia. We are looking at the other professional bodies who would uh, want the status quo to continue. And therefore, it caused government to bring the, all those in the, on the table to discuss and say, this code, adoption of this code is important uh, for I think we've lost you, Veronica. I'm wondering maybe if you turn off your video, although it's, it's a delight to, to see you, but maybe that'll give you better bandwidth. Shall we try that? Uh, we're not having any luck, but um, I'm, I, I was very happy uh, to hear Veronica uh, mentioning there about those who, who really want to Claim. keep... Are you Claiming back? Can you hear me? I can now. I'm suggesting maybe if you want to switch off your video so you get better bandwidth. We had lost you for a moment. Okay, let, let me do that. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. And you had been telling us about, yeah, about uh, them insisting that you have everybody around the table uh, in discussing the regulations. Yes, yeah, exactly. So what we did is that uh, we brought all those on the table, high level uh, meetings that were held uh, so that we have an understanding of why we need the, the court and why we need a national registration. And this was done through series of meetings uh, and uh, the drafting started with, of course, support from uh, the Attorney General uh, Office, who is the legal government advisor. And uh, we were able to do uh, the, the drafting and uh, submitted it uh, to the AG for, for, for guidance. And, and that was done in the early in the 2005. And later in 2009, we, did, we submitted it to the AG and it was actually approved and passed to the cabinet, uh, after which now 2012, it was also now uh, published in the Kenya Gazette and transmitted uh, to the parliament. Actually in the parliament, because it has to undergo three readings, there is, we had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of influence here, uh, industry, you know, uh, going to the members of parliament. Uh, and we held a, a stakeholder consensus meeting in uh, sep uh, September 2012. And this was to encourage policymakers to take action and have the bill uh, adopted for the country. Uh, eventually, we were able to, uh, to the parliament was able to, to, to pass it. That was in uh, September uh, 2012. Although after a lot of intense debate, a lot of media coverage and all that, and uh, the president assented to it on uh, uh, 11th October 2012, and it became an act. Yes, implementation of the act was uh, has been ongoing from 2012, but we have had also challenges because there is continued violation of the act. And this necessitated now the development of the uh, regulations that are already in place, but not uh, yet uh, tabled in parliament. But we have had a lot of intricacy in the regulations even right now, uh, next week, we are going to meet the committee on a delegated legislation of the National Assembly to discuss the, the, the draft uh, regulations. And yeah. therefore, to me, it's bringing the people on the table, all the people, so that we are in one understanding. And the key thing that we have to protect 
the, the child, the rights of the child in Kenya through breastfeeding. Absolutely. Thank you very much. David. Thanks, Veronica. And you've hit, I think you've hit the nail on the head there with that last one. What we're doing here is actually uh, working for the protection of the rights of children, uh, the rights of babies and the rights of mothers to actually make informed choices. And I think you've also demonstrated that this is it's an ongoing process. You can't just uh, get your law adopted and then uh, hope, hope for the best. You need to continue pushing for its implementation and its enforcement. And I think it's important to point out we don't actually want the uh, baby food industry to be helping us in drafting the regulations. Um, we don't, as they say, you don't ask the fox to guard the hen house. Um, at some point, the draft regulations are uh, made public so that there can be comments and we can listen to what the industry has to say. But again, I think you mentioned very eloquently that, that, that they want the status quo and we actually want uh, to change things to protect children. So thank you very much for your insight there. Um, and now we're going to move uh, to the Philippines um, where we are fortunate enough to have uh, Dr. Maria Rosario uh, Verger, um, who is the OIC Under Secretary for Public Health Services um, and the official spokesperson of the Department of Health. So I think we have the right person here with her. But I also noted that you have uh, had past senior management positions um, with the health regulation team, uh, public health services team and the Food and Drug Administration, which I think makes you ideally uh, qualified to provide us with your insight. And so we've moved to the next stage uh, in code implementation because the Philippines was actually an earlier, an early implementer of the code with its milk code back in 1986. But your government also has shown continued leadership in uh, trying to improve upon that um, and strengthen and enforce uh, the, 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 your, your regulations. Uh, and that has meant overcoming many hurdles. And I, for one, remember very well when your government bravely introduced the, um, the very good implementing rules and regulations in 2006, uh, only to be challenged in the Supreme Court by uh, the formula companies. Um, but again, you stood up to that. Um, so I, I'd like to ask you um, for your insight to some of the challenges that you've had to overcome in applying your national law and really holding the companies accountable for their violations. Thank you very much, David, and good evening to all of you. Um, you're right. Uh, our law, uh, the Philippine Milk Code, has been in existence since 1986. And we have again enacted another law in 2018 uh, to support this law, wherein we want to ensure that the nutrition of mothers and children are there. And of course, giving that uh, strength and support for breastfeeding. Uh, the Philippines is a decentralized, uh, we have a decentralized health system. And this is one of the major challenges in implementing this law. We have different local government units with different set of priorities and monitoring and enforcement would be very, very difficult. And it's really quite a challenge. Second challenge would be as what Alison has mentioned a while ago, it's really awareness, awareness of the community, awareness of the government officials, awareness of the of this, uh, the industry specifically of our regulatory process. And that has been a major challenge for us, especially now that we have the pandemic. Uh, we have major setbacks in the country, like there would be disasters, this pandemic, uh, there would be uh, something else that will happen in the community and the uh, industry would always try to make that opportunity or take that opportunity for them to promote uh, this alternative uh, to breastfeeding. And we have to really be positioning and we have to be monitoring well and we have to enforce the law, especially during these times because the families are vulnerable at this time. The third challenge would be the growing baby food industry in our country. There was this study made that between 2016 to 2020, it grew to 6% and milk formula accounted for 95% of that growth. This is a study done in 2021 access to nutrition initiative report showed that there is also that non-compliance among major industry players in the Philippines. So there were these marketing restrictions, but still we are being challenged uh, by this uh, a very huge industry in the country. 
And lastly, I think uh, enforcement and maximizing our police power, especially that, as I've said, we are decentralized. The Ministry of Health do not have any police power, so we have to work with the Food and Drug Administration and the other national agencies so that we can be able to enforce properly. And uh, there is also non-awareness of regulations, especially among the key players in the country, also among the industry. That's why we had several conferences with the industry so that we can be able to make them aware of our regulatory process and they do not have to go through the different legislators so that we can get our attention. Can we thank you please don't mute our speakers <laughs> so that uh, anyway that was uh, part of the my last uh, of the challenges that i've mentioned as i've said uh, we are trying to work with the industry but again there would be this distance and they are not part of our policy and decision making process thank you david uh, thank you so much i think that was really insightful um, and a, a couple of things that you highlighted that i just want to to reemphasize the last point you make that the industry is not part of your decision-making uh, process. Very, very important. Um, I'm also glad that you raised this issue of the pandemic and uh, natural disasters, which as you say, become exploited um, by, uh, the, uh, by, by the, the, the baby food industry to try and create new markets, et cetera. Um, so it's really important that, um, that we make sure that the, the code is enforced uh, during uh, these emergency situations and that we don't allow the companies to use, for example, the COVID-19 uh, um, pandemic uh, to, to, uh, to, to push uh, their products and undermine breastfeeding. So thanks very much uh, for that. Um, and we're going to move um, now to uh, Turkmenistan, where uh, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Gulnaram uh, Jorayeva, um, who's the Deputy Director of the Scientific and Clinical Center for Maternal and Child Health for Research um, and Coordinator of the Program for the Support and Protection of Breastfeeding in Turkmenistan um, for, for many years. And um, you have also taken an active uh, part in the development of national programs, including a comprehensive law in 2016 to um, to implement the uh, to implement the code um, again with uh, with a great uh, uh, resulting in a great uh, increase in exclusive uh, breastfeeding rates in your country. So you should be congratulated for that. Um, and I wanted to ask a little bit um, about the code from the global perspective and the advocacy work that we try and do globally to turn attention to the code and why, uh, why you see this as uh, important um, in, in order to be able to influence national efforts and provide governments like yours with the justification and authority to push forward with code implementation. Thank you. Can we hear you, uh, Dr. Yoreva? Спасибо, показала, как важен иммунитет и насколько тяжело болеют люди с хроническими заболеваниями, пусковым механизмом которых является их здоровье в раннем возрасте. Практически все матери могут кормить грудью своих детей при получении точной информации от членов семей и работников здравоохранения. Эффективность внедрения программы во многом зависит от политической воли страны и внедрением ее на национальном уровне. И в этой связи я хотела бы обратить внимание, большое внимание на то, как, кодекс, как реализация кодекса помогает внедрить национальные программы по грудному скармливанию и поддерживать его на этом уровне. Я хотела бы поделиться, рассказать об области Туркменистана. Охрана здоровья матери и ребенка в Туркменистане является приоритетным направлением государственной политики. И в связи с этим 
программа по грудному вскармливанию явилась одной из первых в нашем независимом государстве и была принята в 1998 году. Нам пришлось пройти очень многое. Это борьба с устаревшей практикой работы родильных домов, это недостаточная информированность медработников. Мы столкнулись с агрессивной рекламой, кампанией и пропагандой заменителей грудного молока, компаниями, которые их производят и которые негативно влияли на показатели частоты и продолжительности грудного скармливания в стране. Эффективность внедрения программ всегда связана с поддержкой правительства и внедрением на национальном уровне. На настоящий момент в нашей стране действует закон, как отметил Кларк, а принятые и подписанные нашим президентом в 2016 году по пропаганде и поддержке грудного вскармливания в Туркменистане. При тесном сотрудничестве, кстати, этот закон охватил все положения Международного кодекса. В тесном сотрудничестве с ЮНИСЕФ в нашей стране успешно реализуется национальная программа по кормлению детей грудного и раннего возраста. И как результат, на сегодняшний день 94 родоспомогательных учреждения – получили статус болезнь доброжелательного отношения к ребенку. И еще новшеством явилось то, что с 2017 года мы стали сертифицировать поликлиники, то есть дома здоровья, на статус учреждения дружелюбного отношения к ребенку. Пользуясь случаем, в этой связи я хотела, я хотела бы поделиться и показателями грудного вскармливания. Если доля эксклюзивного грудного вскармливания в 2000 году составляла 5%, то по данным МИТА в 2019 году уровень исключительного грудного вскармливания поднялся до 56%. В связи с этим я хотела бы призвать все страны ввести в действие или усилить существующие кодексы, свои национальные кодексы и регуляторные механизмы для, поддержа... для поддержки грудного вскармливания, поддержки прав кормящих женщин, распространять информацию и повысить осведомленность населения в вопросах кодекса, что поможет соблюдать его. И хотела бы пожелать плодотворной работы всем странам и успехов в реализации национальных программ по поддержке грудного вскармливания в масштабах всей страны, что поможет сохранить здоровье наших детей. И здоровье, и здоровье наших детей – это здоровое будущее. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for those messages reminding us uh, and, and calling on other countries to recognize the importance of the code as you indeed did in your country and you, you have evidence that it has helped you um, in improving uh, breastfeeding rates um, and, and that is really important. You also alluded to I mean, the code itself isn't going to do anything, going to do everything, but you alluded to the fact that you have uh, facilities that conform to the baby friendly hospital initiative standards, etc. And that's very important, too. Um, so I, I think you would uh, you would all agree that we have had a marvelous uh, selection of speakers here who have given us uh, insight into what it is like to try and be uh, protecting women uh, and babies uh, in their country through code implementation. I hope we can take some lessons, some, some well-earned uh, lessons uh, from our speakers. And um, I'd just like to thank everybody, uh, to, to, to thank our four panelists, and to thank all of you who are, uh, who are listening in today. Um, and let's make sure that uh, the code continues Uh, uh, beyond its 40th anniversary. Thank you very much. Back to you, Chris. David, thank you. Thank you to all the panelists, uh, not least for being inspiring, but also for keeping absolutely two time. We are now 10 seconds ahead, in fact. So I'm going to introduce question two on the Mentimet Mentimeter. Um, if you go to the website, if you look in the chat function, you can see uh, the code uh, to enter which uh, I will just give you, it's 82916853. If you go to menti.com, enter that. And the question is, please share with us one word that describes why the code matters in your community. Hit submit, and we'll look at the responses after the next video, um, about which I'm almost certainly going to have to use the word inspiring. It is from the International Baby Food Action Network, a network founded in the late 70s, 
Ib Fan have been a key actor campaigning, creating the code and uh, keeping it strong and effective. So this is a video about the history of the code. 82 years ago, in the context of the Second World War II, Dr. Cecily Williams, a Jamaican pediatrician, described how companies employ nurses to convince their new mothers that condensed milk was a preferable substitute for their breast milk. Dr. Williams gave a lecture entitled Milk and Murder, in which she stated that misleading propaganda about infant feeding should be punished as the most wretched form of sedition. This death should be regarded as murder. Important remarks on the consequences of the unethical promotion of breast milk substitutes were made by Dr. Jalif Michael Latham and other notable health experts. Nevertheless, it was only until the civil society mobilized after the publication of The Baby Killer by the English organization War on Wand when this important issue became public domain. Public outrage grew when Nestle filed a lawsuit against a group of young Swiss activists who had translated and published The Baby Killer under the title Nestle Kills Babies. The code was won 40 years ago by people power. In 1974, exposés about deadly marketing that harm babies were published in Europe and the U.S. Based on these, I led an interfaith organization to file shareholder resolutions and a lawsuit challenging company practices. By 1977, we formed Infact and started the Nestle Boycott. We mobilized hundreds of thousands of people and put 50,000 letters on Senator Kennedy's desk demanding action. He sponsored a hearing and WHO came to testify. After hours of testimony, the companies would not agree to substantial changes, so Kennedy asked WHO to take the lead. All right, now, then, then my final question is, is what do you do or what do you feel is your corporate responsibility to find out the extent of the, the use of your product in those circumstances in the developing part of the world? Do you feel that you have any responsibility? We can't have that responsibility, sir. May I make a reference to... Uh, you can't have that responsibility? No, 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 no. At WHO's 1979 meeting, Anwar Fazal, Doug Johnson, Andy Chetley, and myself were official delegates. Dr. Hafdan Mahler, then Director General of the World Health Organization, responded to the conclusions of the U.S. Senate hearings and takes up the challenge of drafting a code. In the spirit of the Alma Ata Conference, the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes the code for short, was adopted by the World Health Assembly, the supreme body of the WHO, on 21 May 1981. The U.S. was the only country in the world to vote no, which caused worldwide outrage, and IBFAN was launched on the international stage. At the same meeting, the countries committed to implement the code through national legislation, or regulations and to monitor its implementation. IPFAN began monitoring well before the code. In 1980, we published a booklet with over 600 commercial promotion offenses in over 50 countries to show code drafters why the code needed to be detailed to stop baby food advertising, labeling, samples, and other marketing activities. The International Code Documentation Center, ICDC, trained people in monitoring and published monitoring manuals. Monitoring is important because it gives us the proof to make the code work. We held over 60 training courses all over the world, long ones and short ones, international ones, regional ones, national, where more than 2,000 government officials were trained. Some 67 countries have made laws following that training. IPFAN has concentrated on actually providing governments with the information they need 
in order to bring in good resolutions that actually address the new marketing strategies. The code needs to be like a, a vaccine and it needs to evolve to meet the new variants. So please, let's keep this on the agenda and, and try and make sure that mothers and babies do not have to put up with harmful marketing of any kind. Since the code was adopted, IBFAN has been working uninterruptedly for its implementation in more than 160 countries where its network has presence. In all these countries, IBFAN has undertaken periodic monitoring of the provisions of the original code and the subsequent World Health Assembly resolutions. The code is constantly evolving, according with the changes in publicity and marketing practices being adopted by the infant food industry which approved its code in 1988. And the code is important for the scope that covers products from zero to 36 months. Visions of the international code have been part of the Mexican legislation for years. Nevertheless, conflicts of interest inhibited their effective implementation. Today, important steps are being taken to have a strong national code which will contribute to tackle obesity and diabetes and protect infants in emergency situations. Today, the code is a useful tool to contribute to the fight against climate change since it protects the most sustainable form of feeding babies. IBFAN is also changing every year more young people are joining the struggle to continue protecting babies and mothers from the ever-present greed that moves business. Its most challenging endeavor now is to raise awareness about the perils of the conflicts of interest that constantly undermine the efforts to fully implement the code at the global scale. We are building a new generation that protects breastfeeding to save our mother earth. Construimos una nueva generación que protege la lactancia para salvar a nuestra madre tierra. For eight years of the International Code, we will continue struggling to save lives. Extraordinarily powerful video, and I think remembering that history explains so much about the feelings of the people who've been so involved in it and done so much uh, when any of us seek to form any kind of alliance or partnership with the companies uh, who have behaved like that. Um, I want to now throw to the uh, Mentimeter. Again, I want to have a look at the results from that question too. These are the, the words there, the word cloud from what matters, uh, why, the why the code matters in our communities. Protection is number one. This is a code that protects all children. In fact, it protects all of us on earth, as we just heard it interrupts the existential threat of climate change, health, empowerment, sustainability. Um, I hope these questions, these, this vocab list is going to be available to all of us later on. Um, I want to now uh, go to uh, a talk by Yokling. Yokling's an international lawyer and she's the director of the Third World Network in Malaysia. And she's talking about breastfeeding, first food systems and corporate power. Yokling. Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you, um, ladies and gentlemen, and the organizers for giving me this chance to talk to all of you tonight. Um, I grew up uh, in a society in Malaysia where breastfeeding was normal, but I remember in the 70s, I had my relatives, my cousins with their babies, and there were these white um, suited nurses who would turn out every month to weigh the babies in the family, and they turned out to be Nestle representatives. Um, so for me, uh, being from Malaysia and seeing that video, and all the, all the historical figures who actually are mobilized for us to get the code, it's an honor to be here tonight. Next, please. I think we have, uh, we all are very much in agreement here that we are actually talking about human rights. That is the right to food, which is very, very clearly, since the 1960s, the right to adequate food is a legally binding human right. And adequate, it started off with the right to adequate food and adequacy was very much defined as quantity and quality. And it talks about how we have to look at our social, cultural, economic, climatic, ecological context. It calls for sustainability, accessibility, availability for present and future generations. The missing link, however, is what we call the first food systems. In ending malnutrition in all its forms, we all agree on that. The 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda talks about that. The SDG2 talks about that. And we talk about transformation. 
In 2015, the United Nations, with the highest level of, of, of leaders, political leaders of our world, said we must transform food systems. However, if we look at research analysis discussions, the basic nutrition of mammalian life, mother's milk, is a missing link. It's a very loud silence. First food systems has been, and breastfeeding has been described as nature's perfect food system. But that system is so fragmented, so consciously eroded and destroyed because we, from the time we are as women, uh, want to have babies, we don't have information, we don't have choices. There's no social, political, legal environment that gives us the choice to breastfeed. We know so little, but we get a bombardment. And I think many of the uh, government uh, contributors tonight talked about propaganda, about marketing, about the force of power of the industry. So from the time before we even become a wife or a mother, we already get the messages. And today, Nestle is a very sexy brand. We think of George Cooney. We don't think about the right to breastfeed. So for, for us, it is very important that we have to come back to what the court recognized 40 years ago, that it aims to contribute to the provision of safe and adequate nutrition for infants by the protection and promotion of breastfeeding. Now, this missing link needs to be brought back so that the rights of children to breastfeeding and the rights of women uh, are actually uh, um, uh, reinforced. And to, added to that is right to health. Right to health is so cutting across. It's a natural, that's why I didn't put it into this slide. Now, there's a recent statement by the right, uh, the rapporteurs of the right to food uh, and human uh, and health, together with the working group on discrimination against women and the committee on the rights of the child have come together to say the global, um, the global commercial uh, milk formula industry is so powerful, so all prevailing that it has actually led to a failure to fulfill the rights of children to have the best start in life. And this is something that we have to really start as our starting point. Next, please. Next, yes. Now, the superiority of breastfeeding is science-based. We know, uh, those of us working in this area know that it is so obvious. And yet, why is it that we are still struggling to turn the code into reality? Why is it so hard for us to have national laws passed? And when we have the laws, how hard it is to actually have strong laws and to have those laws actually enforced without fear or favor and without influence from industry. And as we saw from the video, this was a culmination, the court was a culmination of years of evidence collect, collected from lived realities of, of activists in public health and consumer, uh, independent scientific community. And now we are talking about how every aspect apart from some success stories on the whole, compared, for example, to tobacco control, we are actually quite far behind. So economic globalization, I just want to emphasize that intensified in the 1980s, which led to two decades in the 90s and the 2000s of escalated deregulation over corporate actors. In fact, a lot of the rules and treaties, whether they're trade agreements, economic partnership agreements, or agreements in the WTO, actually created more legal rights for corporations deregulate them, we privatize health, water, education, food production. And that is the environment within which breastfeeding becomes so difficult that even we, if we had the paper right to choose, we don't have the reality of choice. And I want to touch very quickly on the technology platforms. Advertising and marketing, which Gerard will talk about more in the next presentation, it has gone beyond, I mean, there's all the gimmicks and all the sophisticated, they have billions they pump into marketing. And now with the technology platforms, it's even more elusive. And this is a challenge for regulation because Google platforms, uh, Amazon, you just Google something and then suddenly, you know, it just populates your screen. And this is a very insidious and very direct marketing that is very hard to regulate. And so the world of the rules being made in the WTO at the moment on e-commerce, which is about digital rules, actually is about deregulation. The wild, wild west of this platform economy does not want to be regulated. So this is something we need to draw our attention to in our next phase of activism. Um, public, the, 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 the bilateral investment agreements, the, the investment chapters in trade agreements have all created in the last 20, 30 years, starting with the North American Future Agreement with Canada, United States and Mexico, where the right of foreign investors was so raised to, an, to a higher elevated role where they can, under those agreements, take a host government as a foreign investor to a private arbitration, which is secret, non-transparent and non-accountable for compensation for loss of profits, including future pro profits for measures, laws, uh, you know, policies, uh, actions that you may want to take as a government uh, dealing with health, environment, labor protection, or promoting breastfeeding. And these could be legitimate actions, but if they cause a loss of even future expected profits, you could be sued for millions and millions of dollars and many, many cases like that in the last 20 years. But because of the sheer injustice of this system, there's been a big pushback. And so for example, 
ironically, it was Trump administration that renegotiated the NAFTA agreement and took out investor state dispute. But this right of investors still exists in many of the trade agreements, especially those involving the South. And we need to that, get that out because rights don't belong to corporations. They are rights of people and children and babies. Next, please. So very quickly, uh, there are, there's a group of us and some of us are actually here uh, tonight uh, as speakers and also with the WHO team. Uh, we are working uh, on the paper that is looking at a whole uh, political economy uh, of, of, of uh, the, the, the infant formula industry. Just very quickly to share, the top five companies today between 2010 to 2018, look at the market share in terms of breast milk substitute. Nestle alone went from 13.8 to 17.9 percent of global the global market share. Danone also went up from 12 to 13 percent. These two are very, very, very influential and big market shares. Abbott and RMMJ have gone down a little bit, and also uh, the Fishland company from the Netherlands has gone up. But you can see the concentration is actually moving more and more to two companies, especially Nestle. And what does this mean? This actually, in terms of uh, global revenues, uh, just the sale of breast milk substitutes, for Nestle alone in 2018, it was about 9 billion, and then down to 7 billion for Danone, et cetera. So we are talking about multi-billion dollar industry. What does this translate to? When you have such huge turnovers and you claim to create employment and you have offices in India and Malaysia and all the countries around the world, that financial power and concentration vertically and horizontally, and this is what we see across all industry, whether it's food, pharmaceutical, um, all, all the technology platforms, there is so much integration that they actually become very powerful. And that financial power translates to immense marketing budgets and immense influence. And the influencers are not just money, they've also taken movie stars, just social media influencers. And they have become those tools for them sometimes for free. But these are the influencers who actually, as many of you have pointed out, are part of the marketing strategy. So at the same time, we also see competition authorities and antitrust authorities in countries that are investigating the behavior of these companies. So in addition to the unethical marketing strategies and the promotion, which is so ruthless and so aggressive, they also evade taxes. They, don't, they, they do transfer pricing. Uh, and there have been investigations and even penalties uh, imposed on many of these companies across many countries by competition authorities. But it is not enough because that power has become very strong. And one of the things that has become very worrisome for the United Nations is that as member states, as the public contribution to the UN system has not increased in terms of assessed contributions, but and also the amount that is actually increased for, um, for the tight contributions to the UN system, including WHO, UNICEF, etc., means that we are actually forcing all these UN agencies into the hands of public-private partnerships, which has become very, very problematic. The dilemma of the UN system, as we all know, and civil society where I'm coming from, have always said that's a conflict of interest, there's non-accountability, we cannot let public-private partnerships with corporations become the norm and become the governance of our policy and norm setting. It's been emphasized so far that we do not want these companies that we want to regulate, we have to regulate, to sit at the table when we make those regulations. And that applies to global policy as well. And so this is something that we need to work on very strongly so that we do not get um, you know, corporate capture happening at the UN level, which is why we welcome as civil society. We work for the, the FANSA uh, framework on engagement with non-state actors, and the WHO still needs to work out a full-fledged conflict of interest policy as across all the UN system. Next, please. And so we are talking 40 years later. This is a voluntary code. We have heard the struggles. We have seen how much we have achieved, but how much we have not achieved. So I would say really simply that the unethical commercial milk formula marketing continues to have a strong stranglehold and has expanded. It's now targeting toddlers and older children, moving from substitute of breast milk to animal liquid uh, substitutes to even healthier uh, you know, options for, for children. And there's a whole, um, you know, the whole chain captures us throughout. And Nestle's integration as a vertical and horizontal company across all sectors captures us for life. So if we don't translate the cost principles and provisions into national enforceable laws, then we will have more business as usual generated in more dangerous ways. And this is, so we call, the call for action is we have to turn this into 
regulations and we have to be putting them at arm's length and we have to make sure that we actually turn rights and monitoring and we have to mobilize society. What it fund has been doing, we need to make it fund stronger and have more it funds at the national level and regional level. Next, please. And so I just want to end by looking at uh, what's upcoming. I said at the beginning, the missing link is looking at mother's milk as the first most nutritious, comprehensive infant survival in the world in one's life. Uh, so the UN Food Systems Summit that's coming up in September uh, has been very controversial because it has promoted very much a, a partnership with the World Economic Forum. So back in 2019, more than 400 organizations actually wrote a letter to the Secretary General saying that we cannot allow this kind of partnership to determine at the summit of food systems where the food direction is going to go. And though I, have, I put the term stakeholder, stakeholder capitalism here. It is a term actually from the World Economic Forum website. This is because there is a disillusionment with corporations, because even governments are realizing that the, the cause of the problem cannot be part of the solution. We all thought companies would give us money and investment, but they don't, not in the way we need them. And so stakeholder capitalism is a phrase coined by the WEF. And this is what we cannot have. So in the letter from civil society to the Secretary General, we said we have we cannot provide transnational corporations preferential access to the United Nations system and be permanently associated with the United Nations and trans, uh, uh, TNCs. And this will actually worsen the crisis. So this is again something that we uh, need to work for. And it is not too late. I don't think it's too late for us to actually say with the food uh, system summit coming up, the missing Food, first food system, which is so important, needs to get in there. So the call to action for me is also to include food, first food systems in the outcome document. There will be a counter summit of public health, civil society, uh, uh, and, and also uh, those working for agroecology, small farmers' rights that will take place at the same time as the pre-summit of, of the UN. And this is some, it, it, and I do believe with uh, governments uh, and engaging with governments, it is not too late for us to make sure that the Food System Summit comes out to recognize the missing link for the day we are born. Uh, thank you very much. I think that's the end of my presentation. Yo, Kling, thank you so much for that talk. I don't know, I think the mic has switched over to me. Uh, horrifying uh, and inspiring in equal measure. I'm pleased you ended on a, a note of hope. Um, you talked about evolution and that's such an important theme here. The, the code must evolve and breast milk is the only substance on earth which has been evolved to provide nutrition. So thank you so much for those words. Next uh, on the agenda, we have uh, the BMS Code at 40, which is a video by the international NGO, Save the Children. The consequences of using infant formula in places like Cambodia can be a matter of life or death. นําคําเพิ่มมีชนบ่ปะเด้ปีเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไปเอาไ
Some well, of the statistics there about the growth of the infant formula market compared to the growth of the world's population are really striking and underline the importance of the work that all of you in this call are doing. Next, we have a talk by Gerard Hastings. He's a professor at Stirling University and he founded the Institute for Social Marketing. He's talking, his talk's called Selling Second Best, How Marketing Works. And uh, he's going to uh, tell us about a study he conducted, how they interviewed marketing practitioners from around the world to unpick the workings of the infant formula industry. Gerard. Thank you very much, Chris. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and it's a great honor to be addressing everybody all over the world on this propitious occasion. Um, I'm going to talk about a study that wasn't just conducted by me, but a, a, a team of colleagues at Stirling University looking at the nature of marketing and how it's conducted. And we did this not by looking at the marketing itself, but by talking to the people who do the marketing. It was very revealing. I'll pick up on where Yo Kling left off. The formula industry is dominated by a small number of very large corporations. These are very big and very powerful, and they are run unstintingly in the interests of their shareholders. So nothing else is allowed to get in the way of profitability. Joel Bacon, in his superb book about the corporations over a decade ago, forensically analyzed the nature of these with the help of a psychiatrist. And he came up with all the characteristics that we uh, are all familiar with about very manipulative and selfish people. They are irresponsible, they show no remorse, they are asocial, and indeed concluded that the corporations are in fact psychopathic in this extent. What we sometimes forget, however, is that psychopaths don't just have these unpleasant qualities, what they also have is a great deal of charm. They couldn't do what they do without winning us over hearts and minds, so that we feel good, even as we are being harmed. And my presentation is really about this charm, which is known in the business world as marketing. Next slide, please. Marketers start off by getting to know their customers incredibly well, almost better than the customers know themselves. What's in their heads, what's in their hearts, their needs and their wants, their hopes and their dreams, their aspirations. And this is not just about trying to pull off a, a quick sale here or an exchange there or a transaction over there. It's about building relationships so that women will do business with these companies, not just once, but throughout their baby and baby's um, feeding process. So they, they're with them for, for years and indeed across generations. So you get to know your customers really well. Next slide, please. The second thing you do is then set about meeting their needs as effectively as you possibly can. And in the case of young mothers, time and again, this is about support and reassurance. This is a very difficult time for, for many, a wonderful time, but a difficult time very often. And they need as much help and support. The word used in that, uh, that uh, word cloud was empowerment. They need that at this point. And the formula companies offer this through helplines and baby clubs. So you sign up to these services and what you get is very, very subtle sale of formula. It's kept in the background. It's first and foremost about getting inside people's heads, but also their hearts and minds. So as this marketer says, baby clubs and helplines, they're the two ace cards for the marketer to play. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. Um, so beyond that, then, if you're really going to support people's needs and help them as much as you can, you cannot operate a one size fits all service. You can't just do one set of advertising, one set of marketing, one brand and expect it to work for everybody. What you do is very carefully segment your um, customers into similar types and then choose ones to target. The, 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 the words here are, are how one of those major corporations targets women across the world. They are deeply patronizing, but it's immensely effective. They ensure that different sorts of mothers with different sorts of hopes and aspirations and needs get exactly what they want in terms of marketing. And that makes the marketing that much more powerful, that much more effective. Next slide, please. This 
effort to get to know mothers, to target them very accurately, to deliver to their needs has been greatly aided by digital uh, technology. They get massive access, they can harvest mammoth amounts of data so that they can understand very, very effectively what women want and they can deliver to those needs with a, a wide array of apps and, and, and uh, uh, supportive messages of one sort or another. So a woman will sign up to the baby club and give her due date, then she'll then fall prey to a series of emails timed for her stage in pregnancy. And if they can manage to acquire these people in their first pregnancy, so much the better, because they know how a woman feeds her first baby is very likely to be how she will feed her next babies as well. So as it says here, first time mothers are the holy grail. Next slide, please. On top of all this, this is all bound together and turned into something that is deeply emotional as well as functional and practical um, with the brand. And we see here one set of brands, so what, what a marketer would call a brand family here. And you can notice they're numbered one, two, three, and four. And these are the milks for different stages in the ba baby's growth. And the first milk in particular is one that's not supposed to be marketing in the least, but see how it connects with all the others. So the brand and the brand family is really the, the jemmy with which they break open the code and uh, utterly undermine it. it, it's, it, it it's almost like the, a musketeer form of marketing, one for all and all for one, and all done in favour of profit. Next slide, please. This cleverness of this marketing that seduces us and wins us over is, is perhaps best demonstrated by a, a campaign came out of the uh, Abbott company called the Sisterhood of Motherhood. If you've never come across this campaign, have a look online, you'll find it very easily. And it tells the story of a group of parents coming together in a park and doing what parents tend to do, bicker about various aspects of child rearing. So they, they bicker about whether they use um, disposable nappies or, or proper nappies, whether they stay at home mums or they're working mums, whether it's the father or the mother, and of course, about feeding bottle versus breast. And they have this dispute, and then in the middle of this dispute, one of the prams suddenly starts to slide down the hill and the baby is threatened. Immediately, they all stop arguing and concentrate on saving the baby, which of course they successfully do, this is a fairy tale. Uh, and at that point, come in, comes in the slogan, no matter what our beliefs, we are parents first. Next slide, please. So you see the decision to feed your children has been turned into just another consumer choice. It's not about evidence, it's not about science, it's not about doing the best for the child, it's about freedom of consumer choice. And in our society now, so materialists, so capitalists, how can one possibly challenge consumer choice? Next slide, please. So finally, if I could come to a couple of conclusions. The formula giants, the, these multinational corporations have graduated from charm school with flying colors. They are superb at what they do. And I think that for us throws up a couple of questions which we can and will answer. First of all, we need to recognize the power of what they are doing. How would anyone believe that someone so charming as these companies have become could possibly sell in such a second rate product. So we have to understand how easy it is for mothers to fall for the, for the manipulative marketing that is going on because it is so subtle and so clever and so determined. At the same time, we should recognize in this that one of the things that companies are doing is offering support to these parents. So as we countermand their marketing, as we succeed in removing their marketing, we must make sure that we also put in a great deal of effort into a helping parents, giving them support, creating an environment in which feeding your baby um, from the breast is a normal, acceptable, rejoiced part of a, uh, a civilized society, making the whole process a lot easier for everyone. As the, as the old African saying goes, it takes a village to bring up a child and we need to make a village where breastfeeding is the norm. Thanks for listening. Gerard, thanks for that uh, equally horrifying talk. I love the idea of the corporations as 
psychopathic. Um, I want to hurry through. Uh, Mentimeter question three um, is we want to learn about code violations in your community. So the code again is uh, 8291 6853. How often do you see uh, code violations and uh, where, where do you, you know, in, in different locations? So um, I'll introduce the next talk while you're answering that and then we'll come back to it. Um, we're hearing from Sonia Hernandez from the Universidad Ibo, uh, Ibero-Americana in Mexico, and she's going to talk about exposure and impact of baby food and formula marketing around the globe. Sonia. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to me uh, be here and have the opportunity to share the results of this multi-country study on behalf of colleagues from MNC Sachi World Hair Organization and from different countries that participated on this study. Next, please. So evidence shows that marketing of formula milk negatively affect breastfeeding practices and continues to be a substantial global barrier to breastfeeding. So there are estimations that annually more than 800,000 deaths of children under five are attributable to suboptimal breastfeeding practices. All the former highlight the relevance of this study. Vulnerable groups such as pregnant women, mothers of infants, can have affected their exercise of free and informed choice by the marketing strategies of formula meal companies. Next, please. So with this background, there were three overarching research questions with, which were the foundation of the multi-study presented today. The multi-country study was commissioned by the World Health Organization and designed and implemented by MNC Sachi World Services. So because of the time constraint on today's presentation, I will focus mainly on the results of the first research question. Next, please. So the study was conducted in two main cities of each of the countries shown on these slides. The study included at least one country of each WHO region, and as well, the countries were selected um, according to the um, income. They were different in income, as well as uh, know, the state of the provision of the code and exclusive breastfeeding rate. Next, please. So the study method comprised a broad methodology with three work streams. The first one, the work stream one, included a desk review and marketing analysis to map the formula milk marketing landscape in each country, providing an insight into the key messages and selling points used by the brands, as well as how women were interacting with these brands via social media on each country. So with this, it was ensured that all data collection tools were um, contextually um, relevant to each country. And for the work stream two, included data collection from pregnant women and mothers of children under 18 months. And it was used qualitative and quantitative methods. The qualitative methods included in deep interviews and focus groups to explore all the themes and topics that are shown on this slide. And the quantitative methods included a survey conducted to a face-to-face -to, -face to examine and quantify the exposure of women to formula meal marketing and the attitudes regarding infant uh, feeding practices. And lastly, the, th the third work stream included primary data collection as well, but from influencers. This included focus group with partners, family and friends, and in deep interviews with health professionals. Next, please. So today I will present the results, organizing them by two key messages, messages that I would like to share with you. Next, please. So the first key message is that pregnant women and mothers for, of children under 18 months are highly exposed to marketing formula through different channels across countries. The marketing occurs simultaneously across multiple platforms with different promotional activities and through a wide range of stakeholders, including health professionals and other mothers. So the results reveal that health professionals are as a trusted source of advice and a key channel for formula milk marketing. 
And there were some variation between the countries on the main channels of formula meal marketing. For instance, social media was most commonly recalled by women in Vietnam, China, and the UK. TV was the highest recall mode of marketing in all countries except Morocco or the recommendation of health professionals that in Bangladesh, Morocco, Nigeria, and South Africa was the mo most commonly recalled. Next, please. And just as an illustrative example, I am showing here the data from Mexico, where along with China and Vietnam recorded the highest number of advertisement in the phone diaries, where women registered all marketing seen across seven days and it showed the extent of formula meal marketing that women were experienced. So here in this slide, I'm showing that from the 240 posts recorded across the diaries, 180, uh, I'm sorry, 138 were explicit advertisement for a formula meal company or a brand. And as you can see, there is a variety of marketing channels with Facebook as the most frequently recorded as well as the TV and followed by the Instagram. Next, please. And the second message that I would like to share with you is about the marketing teams that across country could be categorized by C in six themes. For time constraint, I will focus on those with an arrow. So for the multiple product options, refers on how formula milk companies offer different and suited alternatives, promising satisfying all possible needs. Some products are offered as close to or equivalent to breast milk, undermining breastfeeding adequacy and maternal confidence in breastfeeding. As well, they are engaging women with the brand offering stages one to four, normalizing feeding of formula beyond infancy and um, early childhood, or even before, as in China and Vietnam, that maternal milk, which is a milk for pregnant women, is, is used to establish brand, brand loyalty and familiarity with using formula. The second message is trust and interpersonal connection refer as how formula companies show themselves as support in relation to the common difficulties or nurture doubts and anxiety of um, women about their breast milk quality. So formula companies often position themselves as a partners of women and, uh, and if they are part of this uh, solution to all these concerns. And lastly, with the science, is the use of the scientific development in order to communicate all the products' benefits. And expert knowledge is employed to connect with the health professionals, academic, and scientists to endorse their products. Next, please. So as a conclusion, despite of all the legislation that aims to restrict the marketing of formula milk across countries, marketing for formula milk still occurs. Pregnant women and mothers of infants are exposed to marketing through a range of sources and methods across the countries. Important to highlight how the data across the countries show that health professionals are a trusted source of advice and a key channel of formula milk marketing. All of this is a reminder of the importance of the code both its implementation and the reinforcement to protect women from aggressive formula meal marketing and ensure their right to free and informed choice. La the next, please. And finally, just to recognize some of the colleagues that has been involved in this story from MNC Sachi, WHO, the Mexico team, and I would like to ask you, please, if you go over the next follow, uh, following slides, just to show you all the country teams that make possible this story to happen. Next, please. And then the next one, this is all the people that is behind this story. And um, as well, the uh, scientific um, advisory team, next one. And then that will be it. Next one. And finally, I would like to thank your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sonia, thank you for that wonderful talk and for such a thorough acknowledgement of, of such a wide, wide partnership across countries, nations and institutions. Uh, these industries are, are extraordinary at not just marketing their own products, but at presenting the rest of us as undermining women's choice. 
Um, and your work does a huge amount to help us understand that. Um, I want to go to the Mentimeter question three that we just asked. Um, if I have a look, my own screen's kind of small. Uh, formula samples in healthcare facilities. We had so people are really seeing a lot of social media marketing to families. I have two children, um, one of whom is eleven months old, the other's three, and and we are exposed to a huge amount of this. So I would definitely have ticked that box. Um, now, uh, finally, uh, we, we are not quite finally. Uh, we have a, a video montage. Uh, uh, capturing mothers' experiences of BMS marketing, developed by ILCA, the International Lactation Consultant Association, which is a members' association, everyone who supports and promotes breastfeeding. Hello, my name is Nia. I live in Jakarta, Indonesia. Hello, I am Anna. I am living in Luxembourg. I'm from Syria, my Fauza. Hola, mi nombre es Liz, soy de Ecuador. I'm Barbara, I am Ugandan. Hi, my name is Lucine. And we live in Lebanon. My first name is Carla. I live in Europe, in Italy. Hello, my name is Lauren. I live in the United States. The pediatrician said to me, we will be forced to give her formula, this formula. And he showed me a free package. My milk ran out in less than two months. I get promotions, goodie bags with a um, formula, a can of formula from the hospital too, when I get discharged from the hospital. And I got also phone calls from the sales promotions, uh, uh, keep asking how I feed my baby, how's my baby growing or not. My perception of breastfeeding changed based on marketing efforts. I just felt that breastfeeding would be such a challenge and a burden and just altogether uh, impossible during a time that's already a real challenge. I received lots of samples for formula saying that it was a healthy substitute for breast, breast milk and that it would be much easier on me. So I thought, what a win-win. طلعت بعد لما طلعت من المستشفى عطوني علبة حليب هدية للصبي وبلش الصبي ما يرضع شوي شوي يعني وصرت أنطي حليب حتى يسكت ما عاد يبكي وهيك شيء وما عاد بده يرضع من صدري صار يتكل على الحليب وما فيني أنا على الحليب بأمن له إياه لأنه الحليب صعب تأمينه غالي شوي ووضع المعيشة صعب Cuando mi hijo nació le proporcionaron allí una un biberón de leche de fórmula yo solicité al personal de salud que mi bebé fuera puesto al pecho, lo cual las enfermeras, eh, aduciendo que yo debía descansar, se llevaron a mi bebé y le proporcionaron otro biberón más de leche de fórmula. Esa tarde salí con el alta médica, un biberón y una lata de leche de fórmula en el bolso. My experience at the hospital was not so good because at some point I was asked to introduce formula. So they kept coming in and asking me and telling me that I need to introduce and it's their responsibility. So I was, I was confused and I was actually scared. However, I do wish that the marketing efforts would be more unbiased and factual so that families can make well-informed decisions on how to feed their babies. Uh, I think we need to find a good comprehensive regulations to protect this. There are gaps where the industry still can reach uh, mothers uh, for their aggressive promotions. During antenatal care of this baby I'm holding, because of protection from marketing of formula, there was no exposure of people marketing. But instead, there was counseling on breastfeeding. Health facility did not have samples of formula. Immediately after birth, a male counselor from the health facility supported me to initiate breastfeeding and encouraged me to continuously and excessively breastfeed my baby. My baby boy is now 11 months old and continues to breastfeed. بفضل اخصائي ترضاع من جمعية اي او سي سي بلشنا نعطي الولد على صدري على صدري لحتى صار عمره شهر وقطع الشهر 
وشلنا الحليب بفضله وتتردد علينا كثير لحتى بلشنا نعطيه صدري بلش ياخذ صدري لحتى بلش يكبر شوي شوي وتعرف الوضع انه مش منيح ما فينا قدره على الحليب وما فينا قدره نامن للولد حليب During my prenatal visits, during birth and my postnatal stay, I was not exposed to any marketing material of breast milk substitutes. I feel a great support in my breastfeeding journey. Immunity. Fulfilling. Body. Is respect. Heart. لانه رضاعة منيحة للولد وللام الاثنين منيحة بنفس الوقت وللجيبة اهم شيء لاف وي اولسو نيد تو بروتكت ات اند سبورت ات اند بروموت ات ويز اول اور هارتس سو افري ماذر كان بريست فيت ذير تشيلدرن ثانك يو اندد وورملي بس ايم شور ذير ار ماذرز اون ان هو ديليجيتس هو فاوند ذات فيري traumatic and stressful to listen to you know either as professionals or, or, or through their own experience um we've got one more question on the mentimeter which i'd urge you to to fill in whilst um nigel rollins is is speaking next uh, the code is 82916853 the question is we want to understand how you are going to take act- action uh so for our final <laughs> talk oh So I'm I'm getting a translator in my ear. So I hope everyone can still hear me. Uh, our final speaker uh, is Nigel uh, Rollins, who is talking uh, about uh, protecting uh, breastfeeding uh, from uh, BMS uh, marketing uh, and the way forward. Uh, so if the translators can all mute themselves, uh, that would be great. Uh, and Nigel, I think I'm ready to hand over to you. Then, الفقرة الأخيرة حول أهمية أهمية حماية الردر أصلاً. We're still getting a, a translator coming through, and Nigel, are you on? Uh, have we have we got your voice? Oh, we we can see you now, Nigel, but we can't hear you. Can, can someone can someone unmute Nigel? We've done so well. I mean, I got we got to hand it to the technical team on this. They've done a fantastic job so far. So if this is our only glitch, um, but but we definitely do want to hear from Nigel. Nigel, can we hear you yet? Hmm. We still can't hear. We still can't hear you. Can you hear us? Give us a thumbs up if you can hear me. You can hear me. Um, I don't know if you want to log in and log out and rejoin the call. Would that work? Gronya is apparently on this. Um, so while we're waiting for Nigel, just until I can hear him speak, uh, I just want to urge everyone to visit that Mentimeter question and think about the action you're going to take um, in view of all the different videos uh, that we've seen. Um, And uh, we've got lots of different options there. Challenge, engage, staff training, talk, peer support. And this is really about implementation of the code. It's not just about promoting breastfeeding. It's about how to use that code, how to, inf- how to be a partner in enforcing it, bringing it into legislation um, and making sure uh, that it protects all infants around the world. Have we got Nigel yet? I don't understand how this this happens. Nigel, is anyone speaking to you? Yeah, I told him to log out and then log back in. Okay, log lo- log out, Nigel, and then log back in. Um, if that's all right, uh, I can look at the Q and A, and there are lots of questions coming in on the Q and A. I think uh, the evolutionary question is something I want to return to in my uh, closing remarks um it's come up so much uh and we need to think about how this code evolves and how do we how do we keep supporting it there's a question saying did we do a sound check for nigel earlier we did do a sound check for nigel earlier hello chris uh, can you hear me though? hi hello it's oh, nigel here we can hear you nigel brilliant yeah. <laughs> i was i was right i was i was running i logged, dry. Out. I logged out um, and logged back in again so there we are <laughs> Wonderful. So, Nigel Rollins from the World Health Organization. Final talk. 
So thanks, Chris, and to everyone for a fantastic uh, meeting so far. Um, and I just want to really conclude with a couple of thoughts, putting together various strings from things that have been said so far, and really what it means for us looking forward. Next slide, please. So we've heard uh, really well from many people just, uh, just how marketing is strategic and tactical approaches that uh, not just targets the potential customers, the mothers and the families, but also aims to engage with communities, health workers, politicians. And really in thinking about this, it's, it's about the, this is one quote from a, a marketing expert that the purpose of marketing is not to sell more product, it's to own the market. And therefore you can see this broad and comprehensive approach and therefore really asks, what is our response to this, which must be equally broad and comprehensive. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna really touch on three areas of uh, activity that we must be looking at. There's action at government, at health worker and professional association level, and then at civil society and communities. And this slide really just captures that infant feeding uh, is seen as a business. And that we see that marketing uh, aims to uh, engage with both labor and trade and health and finance and justice. And therefore the responses need to be in the same areas. Next slide, please. And we must be looking at engaging uh, in and putting children at the heart of all policies. And essentially, and most importantly, to enact, invest and enforce the code. We heard earlier from the DG that only about 25 of the countries have substantially aligned legislation uh, that is uh, in line with the code. And then we've got to recognize that there are many other things that are needed as well in terms of maternity protection trading standards. Next slide. At health worker level, we must individually and as professional communities, there are many things that we must be doing that we have to have active and unequivocal unequivocal support for breastfeeding in the face of all the doubts that are placed by marketing. We need to have accurate evidence-based advice as opposed to the innuendo and inference of marketing. We need to correct misinformation and against the uh, and call out the veracity or the lack of veracity of many of the claims. And, and really central to this is that we need to recognize the importance and avoid conflicts of interest both individually at professional association level where associations need to be protecting their membership. And we need to see industries and groups declining industry sponsorship and really seeking alternative models of funding. And lastly, and, and equally importantly, we need to be looking at policy and guideline development that's completely free of economic interest. Next slide. And then really just lastly, a civil society and communities. This is a, a really important area because if we are to respond to a comprehensive system of influence, and that is what we've been seeing so far from political to strategy, to health worker, to the impact on individual women, then we need an informed and coordinated response by civil society and communities. And we need to see a fundamental shift where these groups come to, to own the issue for themselves. At that stage, we are able to do many other things in terms of um, choosing investments that are ethical, asserting right to accurate and impartial information, lobbying for regulations and legislation, and engaging with allies with shared values. And then just the last slide. And we, we really then need to ask, why does all this matter? And it's, it's fundamental because marketing is a sophisticated, coordinated and powerful system of influence at every level. And this is not just about breastfeeding, as important as breastfeeding is, but it is because early infant feeding and those, what happens in the first months fundamentally change the trajectory of lifelong health outcomes. This is why it is so important. And it is a fundamental issue in terms of children's rights and women's health. And so with that, I just want to leave that we all have a place in this um, response. It is not a matter of just leaving it to someone else, but it is us as an entire community from governments right down to individuals in, in society that need to react. Thanks, Chris. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Nigel. Uh, such powerful closing words. I, want, I know we're, we're over time by about 10 minutes. We'll be done in about three and I'd urge everyone to stay uh, for the thanks at the end, if nothing else. Uh, we've, I wanna process the Mentimeter question four. Um, if we can just see what the answers were 
uh, for that. Uh, I don't know if Jeanette can put that up about uh, the things that people are going to personally do to implement the code. Uh, have we got that Mentimeter question? Jeanette is sharing. I don't know if we've got that in yet. Well, while we wait for that, I'll I'll move on to my closing remarks. Um, so I'm I'm a broadcaster. I spend about half my time as a as a broadcaster. Jeanette, is that is that working? I'm not sure it is. We'll come back to that at the very end. If if you put have I frozen? Oh, here we are. Great. Now we can see the share. Yes, thank you, uh, Jeanette. We can see the share. Uh, so I'm not sure. I haven't got any data from this, but if people could click on that, um, we may get some some data at the at the very end. Um, so if you go to the uh, Mentimeter, then uh, you can put in the code and click on uh, whatever actions you want to take, whether it's boycotting, educating, training staff. Um, or campaigning for the full implementation of the code. That's great. Thanks very much indeed, um, Jeanette. I don't have control over my camera, so if you want to put, that's great. Am I now visible? I'm visible. I'm getting little WhatsApp messages. I think so. Here we go. I can see myself. Um, so I'm a broadcaster. I frequently try and communicate to people in the UK and around the world about how to feed children, and it's this area that's riddled with confusion and guilt and anxiety. And the companies, as we've heard from so many powerful speakers, are great at hijacking that and, and exacerbating it. And the genius of the code is to sidestep all that confusion and that guilt. It would have been easy for someone like me, doctors are very good at doing things like this, to write a guideline about how to feed children. And it wouldn't have done anything. So what we have instead is a document that attacks the marketing. And it was written, it's because it was written with the involvement of people like the delegates on this call, the deep involvement of civil society, people at the front line of the problem, that marketing was identified. And the code is therefore not anti-industry, it's not anti-formula, it doesn't preach to women. It increases choice and it protects all women, all parents and all children. And every time I refer to it, with all its dryness and its technicality, I'm struck by how brilliant and simple it is at, at, at its very heart. But the code and all of us as individuals and as institutions are exquisitely vulnerable. We need to keep pushing for the implementation and enforcement. David, you talked about the, the, the companies wanting status quo. Well, as we saw in the UNICEF video, they don't just want status quo. They need to grow the market, own the market, dominate the market. Um, as well as being a broadcaster, I'm an infection doctor. I'm a viral uh, a, a virologist and I study viral evolution and I study this concept in biology known as the red queen it's a concept where all life on earth is in a constant race to stay exactly where it is as prey evolves so do predators and then prey must evolve further and the code is at risk of uh, predation constantly and if we uh, want to look after it we must uh, evolve along with this very sophisticated um, industry the food industry has brought us enormous benefits, but it's also presided over a pandemic, a synergistic pandemic, a syndemic of undernutrition, obesity and climate change. And we are all regulators, very badly paid, underfunded regulators of this industry. And this means two things. Evolution means that that rate of hard work that we heard about in the IBFAN history video, that the extraordinary efforts of the 70s and the 80s can never slow down. We'll never get ahead. We'll never be able to rest on our laurels. The batons must be passed over to uh, people like me who are relatively new to this area. And the second thing it means that most, almost every speaker has underlined is that we must abide by the code ourselves. And that means the code in spirit and in letter, the resolutions and the technical guidance. We must refuse the money. If as soon as we take any institution here represented, a single solitary penny, we become an extension of the marketing departments of these companies. We act as reputational laundromats um, for an industry that's done so much to harm the children that you have all worked so hard to try and protect. 
So the code can only protect mothers if it is in legislation and, and if it is in, enforced. And I really hope that we're all here at age 40. And I hope that in another 40 years, when the code reaches 80, and I'll be in my 80s, that I can, even if I'm not fit to moderate this meeting, I can still uh, attend it and reflect on uh, the progress that people on this call have made over the next four decades. I want to thank everyone for their patience, for letting us run over UNICEF, the World Health Organization, the Global Breastfeeding Collective, and very special thanks from me to our speakers, our panelists, our moderators, the translators, the recorders, and especially the Code at 40 Working Group. Thank you all for coming, and thanks for all you do to make the world a safer place for all of us and for our children. Thank you.